All right, hello. Hey, welcome back. Drew here again with some more poetry. And this one, a rather long one, but it's very, very pointed about Stephen Leacock's views of Malthus. Is the poem right there? Oh, Mr. Malthus. So, it's rather long, so let's go and take our time and, and enjoy it. Mother! Mother! Here comes Malthus! Mother, hold me tight! Look, it's Mr. Malthus, Mother! Hide me out of sight! This was the cry of little Jane. In bed she moaning lay, delirious, with stomach pain. It would not go away. All because her small existence. Overpressed upon subsistence. Human numbers didn't need her. Human effort couldn't feed her. Little Janie didn't know the geometric ratio. Poor wee Janie had never done course economics number one. Never reached in education theories of population. Theories which tend to show just how far our food will go. Mathematically found just enough to go around. This, my little Jane, is why pauper children have to die. Pauper children underfed die delirious in bed. Thus, at Malthus's command, match supply with true demand. Jane, who should have gently died, started up and wildly cried. Look, mother, look, he's there again. I see him at the window pane. Father, don't let me. He's behind the shadow on the window blind. In vain, the anxious parents soothe. What can avail their useless love? Darling, lie down again, don't mind. Branches are moving in the wind. With panting breath, with eyes that stare. Again she cries, he's there, he's there. The frightened parents look, aghast. Is it that something really passed? What is it that they seem to scan? Ghost or abstraction? Dream or man? That long drawn face, the cloven lip, crooked finger all a grip, the sunken face cadaverous, the dress, ah, God, deliver us! What awful sacrilege is that? The choker and the shovel hat, the costume black and sinister. The dress of God's own minister. What fiend could ever urge a man to personate a clergyman? The father strides with angry fist. Out, out, you damned economist. His wife restrains his threatening paw. William, it's economic law. She shrieks. Oh, William, don't you know the geometric ratio? William, God means it for the best. Our darling's taken. We've transgressed and crying... Two times two makes four, and crashes swooning to the floor. And when her senses come again, Janie had passed from mortal pain. And scowling Malthus had moved on, murmuring, That's when more infant gone. To other windows, one by one, later he came and took their son. With Jane and John gone out of seven, it kept at five and just broke even. Mary, the chastened father, said, I feel God's wisdom. Two are dead. The world has only food for five. Quintiplets are the thing that thrive. She sobbed. We'll do it if we can. But oh, that awful mouth, this man. Such is the tale. We have it straight from Wordsworth, pious pen. He happened to be out not late, just after sunset, when he met a little cottage girl. She was eight years old, she said. Her hair was thick. He saw it with curls that clustered on her head, and he recalls in pious verse the interview she gave while sitting, eating porridge on her sister Janie's grave, reciting with her baby voice and placid infant's breath 
The Orthodox Complacent Thought on Pauper Children's Death. And thus the plump and happy child, her belly full of food, drowsy with sunset porridge, smiled. The world was pretty good. With her belly full, satisfied, her mind got woolly. She was just like all the rest. Couldn't stand an acid test. Took her thoughts too near the place where digestion at its base. What the child mistook for knowledge, just fresh air and lots of porridge, here is where biology moves into ontology. But Willie, Willie Wordsworth, if again you walk the street, just meet a little cottage girl and get the thing complete. You'll find her just as charming as a child upon a grave, and her hair and curl in permanent with what she calls a wave. She needs no babbling innocence, no baby words to show. The danger spots are the little tots in moving ratio. That population is a thing that all the world must shun. She'll show you as a theorem in Economics 1. At least until till four years ago, when all the world went crack, and all the world got overfed, and all the world got slack. And by the bump we call the slump, Production's force was torn, and coffee beans went up in flames beside ungathered corn. And melons floated out to sea, and hogs were left unborn. And beer rolled down the Tennessee, and California wine was used as blood for Hollywood, and rye thrown in the Rhine, and super products in a stack. But stop a bit, we must turn back. Turn back to Malthus as he walked o'er English fields and downs, and walked at night the crooked streets of in crooked English towns. Lifeless, undying, shade or man, as one that could not die, a hundred years his shadow fell, a hundred years to lie. The shadow on the window pane when Malthus's ghost went by. He chuckled. <laughs> As he passed night's god's acre filled with dead. The little graves were packed as tight as paupers in a bed. But he never heard the little wings that rustled overhead, or heard the voices in the air of unborn souls lamenting there. He wandered in the summer lanes, and all the world was green. And he never heard the wedding bells of brides that might have been. Tall English flowers that drooped and fell and withered on the stem, victim of Malthus's evil spell. What should he know of them? In rustled silk and lavender, the garden path they trod, and listened to where the hollyhocks and tall dephiliums nod, and whisper to the blushing face behind the bonnet hid, of wedding bells that were to ring, that were but never did. And he never knew the empty homes with angry quarrels rent, never knew the blighted souls out of their nature bent, the blighted life of man and wife where children are not sent, and love's illusion wears away, and single self comes back to stay. He scowled to see the working class was disobedient still. The teaching that the gentry grasped was lost on Jane and Bill. And round the slum, children came, as children ever will. In vain upon the grain of Jane and Bill was cast the thought, and hope of social gain was nil, and poverty was their lot. That social betterment could not permit a baby in the cot. All right, says Bill, we'll have them still. And Jane, she says, why not? I like to see him, reverend sir. Crawling round, and so, so does her. We're not like gentry folks, you see. There ain't much else for her and me. And all the while, the world roared on, each decade passing by. Machine in power and glowing sun to Malthus gave the lie. The silly pedants couldn't see. Man's food grows faster far than he. The wheat plant can easily grow. A hundred grades proceed. Three times a year. What? Baker, ho! How much is it you need? One buckwheat pancake. Only one. 
swells in three months to half a ton. The barley of a single year were turned the Rhine to lager beer. Mm. The oyster with a million lives. If each potential oyster thrives, as with encouragement they do, can turn the world to oyster stew. Our social future only wants bigger and brighter restaurants. Thus, from a hundred dusty chairs in dusty schools of thought, professors' talks with boards and chalks, the works of Malthus taught, explain the social danger hid in each superfluous extra kid. Each decade as it moved along, rehearsed the wearisome sing-song. When numbers on subsistence press, then wages cannot rise. Humanity is in distress because it multiplies. No hope of social betterment can ever be made good because the wicked working class will eat up all the food. So if the poor are here to stay, we need not worry anyway. And patia, et patia, and quack, 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 and there you are. With each decade more and more, two giant forms were seen. To stride across the universe is power and machine. And little man beside them ran, knee high he ran between. All ignorant he was of why, or what these things might mean. Their eyes of brass, their arms of steel, that grip and drive the plunging wheel, that tear the forest, burst the soil, and make the cloven ocean boil. Turn the white torrent's foaming might to strike with death, death, or blaze with light. What is the meaning, little man, and have you got your little plan? Ask teacher. My dear sir, alack, your teacher only says quack, quack. Thus forward drove the world, divorced from any one control. Each man might grasp a little part, no man could view the whole. The giants drove it like the wind, and little man clung on behind. Picture of terror and despair, his coattails flying in the air. Faster and faster on they sped. Machine and power went mad, saw red on little male men. Our little man fell their attack, and smashed his world to bric-a-brac. Broke it with war, and at it cease, they turned and broke it worse with peace. Broke it with overwork, and then with myriads of workless men, starved it with want. Then changed their clutch, and choked the world with overmuch. And when their rage had spent its shocks, left little man upon the rocks of economic paradox. His mournful face and weeping eyes look on his world in mild surprise, see milk on the Potomac roll, and milkless children on the dole. A crazy world it seems, grotesque, where all this theory is burlesque, all jigsaw bits where nothing fits, so there he sits, bereft of wits, and murmurs through his little hat. Will someone tell me where I'm at? Start once again, little man. Remember where you first began. What a determined cost you were, and how your efforts made a stir. Recall again through time's din haze, the dear old Neolithic days. <laughs> With bedroom exercise your shape, you raised above the common ape. You muttered to yourself, they'll see. There's no orangutan in me. Practice every manual trick, like how to use a pointed stick. Bent down a bow and let it go and grasped the notion of a bow. Deep seated in a cocoa tree, you learned to count as far as three. Moved into theory, went higher. You saw that heat was got from fire. You did not know it, but you were the first research professor, sir. Contained within your hairy body, a noble, noble Rutherford or Saudi. Nay, what is more, your lot was rude, but showed the college attitude. You made it an unswerving rule to disregard the common fool. 
You overlook this silly chaff of laughing jackass, gay giraffe. You heeded not the caustic smile of dinosaur or crocodile. Past undisturbed the ridicule of cosmic crow or hee-haw mule. In short, in culture's earliest span, you acted like an Oxford man. Their idleness soon proved their loss. You made yourself creation's boss. Do it again. See what I mean? Come, little man. Beat the machine. You slew... You that the pterodactyl slew... Show this new demon who is who. And first you have to throw away the stuff that led you all astray. Numbers are not the bane of man. And numbers ne never yet outran. Go think it out. I'm sure you can. For want and poverty may come to empty prairie. Crowded slum. Enough, enough. It's quite enough. Get rid of all this Malthus stuff. Let's seek the shade of Malthus out from where he walks at night and bring him up for punishment. It certainly seems right. He that misled a hundred years man's footsteps from his path that turned our household joy to tears. How shall he fear our wrath? Shall boiling oil reduce his flesh to king, chicken a la king? Would molten lead upon his head be pretty much the thing? Ah, no, not by gone cruelty his erring soul, soul shall harry. Will fit the punishment to crime, make Mr. Malthus merry. Ho, Reverend Robert, come and doff that cleric suit. Yes, take it off. Nay, never mind the leather face, the faded parchment skin. Come, stand up, Robert, chuck a brace. Another life began. We'll dress him all in love's attire. A great grandfather's new, as one who led a bride to wed the year of Waterloo. Behold the sandy beaver's hat, sandy colored suit, the gorgeous vest, the high cravat, the glowing hessian boot, enormous buttons made of horn, a wedding bridegroom shall adorn. Oh, hear the bells that ring ding, for Malthus, youth la mebian, population for the nation spells and tells its long salvation now hold the chime a little time mouth is the ringer stand beside and let us go and bring the bride she stands upon the garden path which she was wont to tread eternal flowers and no not death still nod beside your her head in rustled silk and lavender a hundred years alone is it in truth a maiden's form or withered frame of bone? Seek not the hooded face to scan where hides the drooping head. Perchance the curls lie damp upon the features of the dead. Perchance in place of glowing life, now desiccated, null. Earth's final parody of love, the simpering of a skull. Or maid, or ghost, or pictured fate, let her be what she may. We bring her forth to join her mate, this golden, golden wedding day. Moving before us, singing in chorus, golden and glorious, time-honored lay, of wearing a bonnet, a, a blue ribbon on it, on a golden wedding day. Bring on the same old thesis of how man increases as the clover blossoms blow. And we'll sing such pieces till we get paresis, and we go where ratios go. For if man increases, if he never, never ceases, if he never, never says, go slow, if he will not let the pop stop, why then, ergo, there is a drop stop. But it's all right. Let her go. All right. Oh, Mr. Malthus by Stephen Leacock. Done in one take. <sighs> okay. Long poem. Kind of iffy ending. But you don't see too many people trying to take on economic issues in a poem. Not by a long shot. All right. 
So thanks, Mr. Leacock. And his stories are kind of fun. If you can find them, uh, they're good reading. All right. So thanks a lot. This is Drew signing off. See you next time.